The south coast of New South Wales has areas of great beauty and fascination, where nature is both the lesson and the teacher. At Kaiola, students visiting the Australian National University's field station can experience the variety and complexity of nature as they develop techniques for scientific field study and research. Stretching from the Tasman Sea to the Maramarang Hills, the 384 hectare property includes a variety of ecological patterns and vegetation types. Sand dunes and salt marsh, a lagoon and a saltwater creek, open farmland and forest. Joy London lives in the main homestead, which has been her home since 1929. As I say, Dad was in uh, Kamasi, West Africa, which is now Gama and he died in 1920. Well, Mum brought the mother, her mother and father, and her sister out back to Australia. Mum was looking around for a property, and in the bank one day in Braidwood, the manager happened to mention to Mum that there was a property down on the coast. She had had a look around other parts, down Eumerella and all around or different areas like that and came down here and that was in March and flood rains. I don't know why she bought it. <laughs> anyway, she liked it and from that we've been here ever since. It was built originally that four rooms in 1910, 1910, 11, somewhere around about that time. The cottages were all built at that time. They were all occupied when we came here, different people there, and when the war started or the mills had been closed, they gradually drifted. Came round, the, our holiday makers came, so we used to let them for holiday times. Yeah. Of course, not up to date like they are now, although they are still original. They've only been repaired, those cottages. This has been added on, the homestead. Here, the trees have been planted. It was all bare then. The bedroom on the front here, on the right, was the windows on that came off the northern Firth. It was wrecked on Brush Island, the northern point of Brush Island. That was in 35, I think that was. We saw the boat go by. It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Reasonably calm. Well, my brother was here, my uncle was here as well. We used to work the property, you know, the cattle, and growing our own crops. We had horses then, in those days too, and a blacksmith. Then eventually we had, went into like a small dairy and supplied the camping ground and Borley Point for the people around. We made the road up the back for 12 miles. We did ourselves up through the forest. We used most of the Jinka roads where we could, widened them, and that way took them out, because this was all forest area for the mill. Uh, the original school was on the right-hand side, but that was not used while we were here. But then uh, my uncle had trucks, and his drivers, the family, you know, there'd be families of them and a few kiddies around. So mum built a, supplied the timber and the rest of us built the, the schoolhouse, which is now in the avenue. They drew it over, hauled it over. Pat Walker was here when she used to come over sometimes for vegetables and milk. I have a clear memory of uh, coming up for yeah, vegetables, vegetables, or really I was primarily coming for your company. <laughs> <laughs> the interest of your company and so on. Mum mm. used to do the flowers and I'd do the vegetables. Yes. Always. And then she'd come along, can I put this in there? And I'd make your cabbages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said to me, Pat, do you think the university would be interested in this place? I thought, whoops, how absolutely brilliant. 
Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. What a, an amazing, an amazing thought for a person to have. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When there are all those real estate agents out there yeah. who would only be too keen to go gobble, gobble. Gobble, gobble in there. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So that's how it came about, really. They came my way, that's one thing about them. It's what I'd set out to. I wanted them. Yes. They agreed to. Yes. Well, I came into it, I suppose, when uh, my wife came back from gathering vegetables with Joy and told me that Joy was interested in giving the property to the university for some purpose or another. So when we got back to Canberra, I went directly to our administrators. In those days, in Anya, we were very lucky. We had a, a very small, highly intelligent and responsive administration. I put it to the council fairly soon, as I recall, after Donald's interview. And um, it was discussed on council as to whether this was a wise thing to do. You know, it stands to reason if somebody offers you a mile of lovely uh, Pacific Ocean coastline with a hinterland of uh, varying types of uh, agriculture and forest country, you'd be a lunatic not to go for it, wouldn't you? Now, certainly this was not uh, an easy decision for me to take to take it to the council because it had the riders, as you probably know, that uh, that in uh, in accepting the gift, we're accepting a a responsibility forever and that's a very unusual thing i think only a university or maybe a church could undertake such a uh, such a responsibility or give such a pledge uh, joy had this property which she received from her mother and um, she didn't want to see it broken up into uh, small seaside dwellings and uh, fishing houses and so forth um, so she made it a condition that, uh, that we should agree to use it forever in simple state, keep it in simple state, and use it uh, for university purposes uh, and simple farming, and not to subdivide it other than for university's own purposes, consistent with the uh, use for biological studies, both teaching students and research. Joy was not wasn't joy wasn't giving away something useless something she wasn't giving away something which had even become useless to her she was giving away her major asset and in a sense her only well certainly her only major asset and it was one into which she and her family had put an enormous amount they put half of their lives and this was half of the lives of an extended family. All she was asking was that the place should be kept more or less in its present state in perpetuity. Now, of course, to Joy, that would seem a very small thing to be asking, and indeed it was, a very, very small thing indeed. But to an organization like the university, The notion of doing anything in perpetuity produced all kinds of, of legal problems. Now, it was simply the practical matter of how far can a university council at this point in time uh, set up rules which were going to be binding on uh, their successors a hundred years hence. It's something which Australian universities really haven't had a great deal of experience of. The, those years preparatory to the actual handover um, were years which led to the principal characters in the plot uh, learning to trust one another entirely. A large garden party was held at Kaiola on the 1st of March 1975 when Joy London officially handed over the deeds of her property to the university. Kaiola is now called the Edith and Joy London Foundation in memory of Joy's mother and in gratitude for Joy's generosity and foresight. 
Professor Donald Walker was the first chairman of the management committee formed to coordinate the activities of the foundation. Academics, students and other helpers repaired the cottages to make sleeping quarters and installed a dining and amenities block. A donation by the Frankel family enabled a laboratory to be built and the Edith and Joy London Fund to be started. In August 1992, the committee held its 100th meeting. Several of the founding members are still active in the committee. Oh, I wanted it kept reasonably in the same condition as we had it. And it had to be for research and all their ins and outs. And uh, it will be. It's taken them many years to follow what we wanted, but it's coming and it will improve. Uh, for some years, Joy took on not just the managing the farm, assisted by her uh, long time manager, Neil Evans, but also the management of the place, uh, of the university's aspect of the place. It was Joy who uh, handed out the keys to the, uh, to the cottages. It was Joy um, who answered all the queries. It was Joy that chivied people about closing gates and so on. And she did that for many years and in an utterly unpaid capacity. I mean, she was getting nothing out of this, except an involvement in the place. And she's always been very keen to have that involvement both on that personal level and by her membership of the management committee, which has been very important to us. The characteristics of the agreement that were made, the major characteristic of the agreement that was made between the university and Joy London was that the property should be used for certain restricted university purposes, particularly the teaching and research in the field sciences. And that the university would protect the general organization and layout of the property in perpetuity. Now, I think we could see, the academic people concerned, could see that we had here the opportunity of setting up a place for teaching and research. Now, teaching is fine. Uh, you can bring in your, uh, your students in job lots, as it were, and uh, take them out and teach them field techniques. Um, which is, which can only really be taught in the field, of course, and introduce them to the recognition of problems, because for many subjects, particularly biological subjects, the problem first presents itself by observation of what is happening in the field, what is really happening. And you may later, of course, take the solution of that problem back into the laboratory and do it with, and tackle it with all sorts of clever machinery and so on. But you begin and you finish in the field. If you want to do any long-term monitoring research, uh, then you have to have security. And uh, the security of tenure, uh, just pure security of tenure, um, was something like a place that a place like this could offer. Most people who, who visit this place, particularly, I mean, yes, most people from outside the university who visit this place, and particularly on these open, in these open weeks, have very little idea about what a university is about. But here, tucked away in the countryside with, nevertheless, a big um, holiday population arriving from Sydney, Wollongong, so on and so forth. The university reaches quite a different, quite a different public. And I think that it should 
We hadn't really thought of that in the early days as a major feature, but I think it should now be seen as a very important development. Before we forget those early days, we should record not just Joy's generosity in, uh, in giving us the place, that of course was the major, uh, the major act, but the great, the immense amount of time and energy and thought that all kinds of people put into its early establishment and I think particularly of those members of the first few years in particular of the management committee, or practically all of them academics, who gave so much of their time and their energy to the basic needs of the place, like replacing the roofs on the cottages, quite apart from designing, teaching and research and so on and so forth. This, these were labors of love. I, I've been a member of the management committee until recently when I, uh, I resigned from it. Uh, it's obviously been a great advantage to the students and to research workers both at the ANU and to the, what is now the University of Canberra and the University of Wollongong and also as a conference centre for people coming together to discuss like things. But I think the main advantage of it will appear in 50 years from now, or maybe 100 or 200 years, when it is still a simple uh, scientific uh, habitat that uh, is accessible to the university, accessible to all sorts of people, but is uh, a, a part of the history of the coastal area. I wanted it kept as they could, and I thought, well, why not do it while you're alive? See what happens. I think it's beautiful as it is. <laughs>